Good morning. What a blessing it is for us to be here together to be able to worship our Father in heaven. I hope you counted a blessing in your life uh, to gather together every, together every first day of the week, every opportunity that God gives us to worship Him truly. It is, a, it is our privilege and honor to be able to do so um, on a weekly basis. I'm excited to be here with you all uh, this morning. You know, there are certain topics that a preacher can preach on that I suppose he could never really preach enough. Uh, I suppose there are certain topics that just can't be done justice, and no matter how many times you talk about them, or no matter how in-depth you go, you're just not giving it justice. Now, I do say this with also understanding that we are tasked with proclaiming the whole counsel of God, Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, thus there are many things that we should talk about um, within our assemblies and within our classrooms. There was a preacher who once used to always and only ever preach about baptism. Um, and so I guess if there was only one topic you were ever going to preach, baptism I suppose would be the one. Uh, but his elders wanted him to expand his uh, library, I suppose, of sermons. And so they told him, why don't you just start in Genesis and work your way through the Bible and then you'll hit different topics as you go. And so he said, okay. So we got up on Sunday morning and he said, in Genesis chapter 7, we read about the account of Noah and the ark and how he had to build the ark because of the flood. And that brings us to our topic of water for this morning, talking about baptism. Now, I don't know if that story is true or not, uh, but certainly we understand there are a plethora of topics that must be discussed when it comes to a preacher and the things that he talks about. However, I do believe that there are certain topics that should be covered perhaps once a year, every year, maybe more than that, maybe less than that. Um, and this morning, I believe, is one of those topics. Because this morning, I believe that one of these topics is it's a topic that must never, ever be forgotten. A topic that must never, ever be pushed out of our minds. It's a topic that we must never, ever lose sight of when it comes to our faith and who we are as Christians. It was the year 1707 when Isaac Watts penned the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You know, many believe that the inspiration from this song came from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, beginning of verse 14, where the Apostle Paul said, But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world." You know, sometimes in life, we find ourselves struggling, don't we? Sometimes in life, we find ourselves not knowing where to go, where to turn, not knowing what's going on in our lives. And it's at those times that I encourage every single one of us to survey the wondrous cross. When you find yourself lost, don't know where to go, don't know what direction to move yourself in, I encourage you to survey the wondrous cross. When life seems bleak, when it seems dark, when you just simply don't know what life is. Survey the wondrous cross. But I guess you could also flip that coin, couldn't you? When life seems to be going well, when you can see the blessings, when you see the sun, you see everything seems to be going as it should, also survey the wondrous cross. There are four things that I want to look at this morning. Four things as we look at the wondrous cross, and I hope that they will be helpful to you this morning. As we look at the first P when we survey the wondrous cross, I want you to think about the person. I want you to think about the person of the cross when we survey this wondrous cross. You know, I mentioned last week about the deity of Jesus Christ, and whenever we study about the deity, it is something that's somewhat hard for us to comprehend because we really don't grasp it. We really can't grasp it because of how high and magnificent the nature of our God truly is. He is something that is completely different from us and we could never even fathom, even if we tried to understand everything that there is about the nature of God, we just simply could not. That's how amazing our God is. But when we look at Jesus and the relationship that He has with His Father, we understand that as the Son, He is still part of the Godhead. Jesus said in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 10, He said, Do you not believe that I am, the Father, I am in the Father and the Father in Me? He said, The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on My own authority, but the Father who dwells in Me does the works. Jesus was God in heaven. Jesus was God on this earth. No matter what was going on, no matter what was being said, no matter what people believed about Him, He was still Almighty God. In fact, Titus chapter 2, beginning of verse 13, the Apostle Paul said, "...looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ." 
who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Jesus Christ, both man and God, which is why He's so relatable to us. And we'll look at that in just a moment. I think about the book of Acts. I want you to go to Acts chapter 2 with me this morning. Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 20. I think about the fact that as Peter is standing here, on the day of Pentecost, standing before all of these thousands of individuals, these men and women, these people who have just crucified Jesus Christ. We know Jesus, when He was there on that earth, He was hung on the cross. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But He went to the grave. He rose. He conquered death. He ascended into heaven. And during the sermon, while Peter was preaching, he begins by saying this in verse 22, He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through Him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you've taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. There's a couple of things I want to think about as we look at this passage. Number one, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus was an earthly man. We know that Jesus was a man. We alluded to this already, but we know that Jesus Christ, being God, came to this earth, took the form of <coughs> excuse me, flesh and blood. Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verses 6 and verse 7. The apostle Paul understood emotion. Or excuse me, Jesus understood emotion. He felt emotion. He felt the pain. He felt everything that you and I have ever felt, all of our highs, all of our lows, every position and situation that we find ourselves in, Jesus has felt those emotions. Why is that so important? Passages like Hebrews chapter 4, beginning of verse 15, the Bible says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You see, if Jesus Christ was never a man, If Jesus Christ never came to this earth and never took flesh and blood, never became like us, Jesus could never say, I know exactly what you are going through. Jesus would never be able to sympathize with any of us and the things that we endure while we're here on this earth, but He did. And thus we know we can go to Him because He's experienced everything that we've experienced. It's simply amazing when we think about Jesus, how relatable He is, because He was human just like each one of us. But then we think about the fact, as you look at Acts chapter 2, that also God worked through Jesus. God worked through His Son. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth to fulfill all of the things that God wanted accomplished while He was here on this earth. All of His power, His teaching, (coughs) His miracles, all of those things, everything He did, Jesus pointed every single person to the Father. He pointed every single person back to Almighty God because that was the one who was going to receive the glory. I think about the purpose of Christ while He was here on this earth. Mark 10, 45, our Scripture reading read just a moment ago that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. We'll look at passages like Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. The Son of Man did not come to, or rather, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, before time began, God knew that we as mankind, we as creation, were going to need a Savior. Before we ever made it to this earth, God in His foreknowledge, God in His amazing wisdom knew that we would need that perfect sacrifice. He knew that even from the time of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and the sin that they committed all the way to the time up to where we are now, there was going to be the need for a sacrifice. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Jesus came to earth to teach, to perform miracles, to help those around Him, but He ultimately came with the purpose of going to the cross. Jesus Christ came to this earth to give His life for us, to take the burden of our sins on His back, and to die that cruel death. He willingly went to the cross because that was His purpose. But then number four, I think about the fact that we as individuals crucified Him. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Literally, did we crucify Jesus Christ? No, not literally, not physically. But do you and I have access to His blood? Absolutely. Do we have access to the forgiveness of sins? Absolutely. Are we completely cleansed and washed when we go to Him? Absolutely, we are. 
and it's because of the things that we have done. Can he still feel the nails every time I fail? Can he hear the crowds cry, crucify again? Am I causing him pain? Then I know I've got to change because I just can't bear the thought of hurting him. Being a Christian means you and I understand that the sins that we have committed in our lives are the sins that put our Lord on that cross. But you and I also understand that our sins are not what kept Him on the cross, but rather it was His love for you and I. That's how amazing this person is. When it comes to talking about the cross, Jesus Christ, simply unfathomable when it comes to what He did for you and I. Here's number two. As we look at the wondrous cross, I want you to think about the pain. I want you to think about the pain of the cross. When you and I look at the suffering and the pain that our Lord had to endure, it's truly nauseating if you ever study about it. If you ever think about it, if you ever watch it, try to watch it, it's really difficult to do so. The scourging that the Romans perfected, making someone suffer, without killing them, and what they put our Lord through, it's hard to imagine. The victim in the middle, two soldiers, one on either side, alternating lashes as they go back and forth across his back. Those whips that they were using, those pieces of leather flowing out from it, with those pieces of bone or metal, whatever it was, lodging into his back time and time again. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Passion of Christ. Uh, but there's a scene in that particular movie while they're going through the scourging where the soldiers, and this, this is how they depict it, the soldiers, when they whip the back of Jesus, on one occasion that whip wraps around to the front side of His ribs. And the soldier rips it out, just exposing everything that is there on His side. It's hard for us to imagine something like that, isn't it? It's hard for us to think about you and I ever having to submit ourselves to that kind of torture. It's hard for us to think about the pain that He had to endure because we've never had to go through that. Hopefully, we'll never have to go through something like that which He went through. Dave McClister said this, he said, "...for they say that the bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges, even to the innermost veins and arteries, so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view." I think about that scarlet robe that they placed on his back. How after he had been bleeding there, how surely it absorbed that blood. And then they viciously ripped that robe off his back, no doubt opening every wound there on his body. I think about the crown of thorns that they placed into his head. I think about the beatings, the mistreatment, the crucifixion itself with the nails and the spear. I think about how the suffering of our Lord truly is second to none. Certainly, there was copious amounts of pain that our Lord had to endure. All for what? For you and for me. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 21, he said, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in His steps. Not only did our Lord suffer, but He suffered unjustly, didn't He? You see, when someone went to the, the, through the process of scourging or through the process of crucifixion under Roman law, it was because they were criminals. It was because they deserved it. It was because they had done something that was against the law. And so the Romans thought that this was the appropriate punishment for them, and oftentimes it killed them on the spot just like that. But what did our Lord do? What had He done to make Himself deserving of everything that He went through? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus wasn't deserving of the pain. Jesus didn't do a single thing that warranted that scourging. Jesus didn't do a single thing that warranted that crown of thorns or being beaten or being mocked or being blasphemed. But notice, He left for us, as Peter says, an example. He left for every single one of us an example through His endurance of the suffering, the suffering that He didn't even deserve. He showed us how to act. To endure, yes, but specifically the fact that you and I as Christians are going to face unwarranted and undeserved treatment. As Christians, do you endure? As Christians, do you allow yourself to make it through 
all of the things that you don't even deserve simply because you're a Christian. We put the things that we go through on a scale, on a level of what Jesus, compared to what Jesus had to go through, Jesus going through something far more than what we would ever have to endure. Can we endure what we have to go through simply for the cause of Jesus Christ? You see, our Lord did. Our Lord knows what we're going through and He's been through more. As we survey the wondrous cross, we see the pain that He had to go, that He had to go through. Here's number three. I want you to think about the purpose of the cross. As we sit here and as we continue to survey the wondrous cross, I want you to think about the purpose. I want you to think about the purpose of the cross. I want you to imagine this scenario with me this morning. I want you to pretend with me this morning that there is no Jesus. Let's just say that there was no Son of God that came to this earth. And there are some people out there who believe that. There are some people who say that Jesus Christ never came to earth. And I suppose that's another topic for another day. But let's just say for a moment, let's just say that there was no teachings. Let's just say for a moment that Jesus Christ never came to earth. There was no power. There were no miracles. There was no healing. There was no three-year ministry. There was no Him teaching in the temple like we talked about last week in Luke chapter 2. There was no sacrifice. There was no shedding of blood. There was no illegal trial. There was no mockery, no beating, no blaspheming. There was no Savior. Let's just say that that's where we are for just a moment. Where would that put us? Where would that put you and I just simply as individuals, as people? What would our lives look like? What would our futures look like? How would that affect the way that we interact with one another on a daily basis? You see, the purpose of the cross was so that you and I could simply have access to one word. That word being hope. You see, if there was no Son of God, if there was no sacrifice, if there was no Jesus, if there was no shedding of the perfect and sinless blood, you and I would be simply living a life that lacked any kind of hope for something greater or something better than this world. How terrible would that be? To know that all of the things that we have to endure in this life, there's nothing greater, there's nothing better, there's nothing beyond what we see here in this life. But that didn't happen. Three passages I want you to look at with me very quickly this morning. First, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 7, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. Notice this. For indeed... Christ, our Passover, was what? Was sacrificed for us. Notice the next passage. Hebrews chapter 9. Beginning in verse 22, the Bible says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, there is no way that our sins could be cleansed and could be washed from ourselves. Next passage, Hebrews chapter 9, a little bit later down, verse 27. And as is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to what? To bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin. Why? For salvation. You see, our perfect Lord, with no sin... No blemish, nothing wrong with him at all, came to this earth to shed his blood. He purified us, he cleansed us, he made us whole, and he became the Passover lamb for us, giving you and I as individuals even the slightest opportunity, the slightest chance to appear before God on the day of judgment and to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And how it had everything to do with me. How it has everything to do with you as an imperfect and faulty individual. See, that's how personal all of this is. That's how personal the cross is. That's how personal it should be when you as a Christian survey the wondrous cross because it was my sin that put Him there. It was your sin that put Him on that cross. And yet, like we said before, it was His love for us that kept him there. Here's number four this morning. The last one we'll talk about. Number four. 
I want you to think about the promise of the cross. I want you to think about the promise of the cross. What does the cross give us? When you look at that cross, when you look at Jesus hanging on that cross, as we survey it this morning, what does it give us? What significance does it play? Why is it even important? Why should I, as a Christian, day by day, survey the wondrous cross? Brothers and sisters, you and I survey the wondrous cross because of the promise of heaven and salvation. You and I understand that without the cross, there is nothing left for us. We talked about that a minute ago. We would live lives simply most miserable among all men. There would be no hope for us. You know, when I look at the cross, there's a showcase of emotion, isn't there? There's a showcase of emotion when I look at the cross. We see God's love for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, a passage we know well. God demonstrating His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But then within that, we also see the forgiveness of God. We see His attitude of forgiveness to every single one of us. Ephesians 4 and verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Even as God in Christ has forgiven you. You see, we, within all of these emotions that we see, God makes a promise. Within the cross, we see a promise, and we understand that God keeps that promise. God the promise maker is God the promise keeper. His Son came to earth. He became a man. He took on the burden of our sins. He went to the cross. And it is because of that that we have a hope of eternal life. We have a hope of heaven. We have the promise of the forgiveness of our sins. We have the promise of an escape from the eternal torture that the other side offers. You know, it's interesting when we think about it because God didn't have to make that promise to us, did He? God didn't have to make a promise to you and I as His creation. He didn't have to give us anything because God doesn't need any of us, does He? God is so high, so powerful, so holy. God is so much more than each of us are. He didn't need any of us. But He made a promise to us. A promise that if you and I live faithful lives, a promise that if you and I do what we're supposed to do, we abide by the words of this book, once all of that is fulfilled, that wondrous cross will be what has saved us in the end. You know, there's so much for which we have to be thankful for in this life as Christians. Brothers and sisters, above everything else, we must be willing to thank God for that old rugged cross. If there's nothing else in this life that you see of, value, of any value or of any importance, I hope that you're able to look at the cross. That you're able to see the love of our God. That you're able to see everything that God has done for us from the beginning of time. Again, Titus chapter 1 shows us that. In His foreknowledge, His planning, His wisdom, He knew that we were going to need a sacrifice. He knew that we were going to need a Savior because of our sins. Romans 3 verse 23, none of us are exempt from that. And it's because of His love for us that we even have the opportunity to look at that cross, to look at that blood coming down, to knowing that if we're obedient to Him, that blood is what washes us and cleanses us and makes us whole. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you don't, you're not a Christian. Maybe you understand that this blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary is what cleanses you. Maybe you understand that coming into contact with baptism, that water representing that blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary that is going to wash your sins away. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Maybe you're ready to submit yourself to Jesus Christ this morning. Know that you can do that. We can baptize you in the water. We talk about the Ethiopian eunuch all the time. In Acts chapter 8, Philip preached to him. They went down into the water. He baptized him. He came up and he was rejoicing. Why? Because he knew that he was on his way to heaven. Maybe you're here tonight, or this morning rather, maybe you are a Christian, but maybe there's sin in your life. Maybe your life is not in alignment with the Word of God. Maybe you're not living in harmony with what God would want you to do. Know that you can change that. You can fix that. You can repent of those things. You can put all of those things behind you. We can pray for you, and God will forgive you, and we'll do all that we can to help you and to encourage you. If you have any this morning, won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.